I had finally made it off the streets and into college. My dream of becoming a doctor was within reach. Then I made the biggest mistake of my life. I'm Cheryl Racinos. I'm a doctor and an author. The first time I ran away, I was five years old. It was right after my brother, Kevin, had been sent off to foster care. And I started to wonder about where I belonged. And I had a grand scheme where I was going to go to the store down the street and find new parents in the middle of the night. That didn't work. And when I was 13, I stole money from my dad so I could buy a bus ticket. And I ended up all the way in Hollywood at 13 years old. That was a 3,000 mile journey and it was hard. I, I learned a lot more than I expected to learn. I found out very quickly it wasn't safe to be a young girl on the streets. And I tried out some of the teen shelters and I tried squats, which are you know abandoned buildings where people stay. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life then, but I was arrested for being a runaway and I was sent back to North Carolina. I was sentenced to up to two years in juvenile prison, maximum security for the money I stole from my dad that first time I left home, $250. The judge put me in maximum security because he felt like I was a flight risk, and he was probably right. I was running and no one was asking why. I ended up spending 10 months there because I got out on good behavior, but during that time, you know, I, I was assaulted, jumped. A lot of the people that I was in there with were truly in maximum security because they had done things that, you know, warranted being in maximum security, but I had stolen money from my dad. I had a misdemeanor larceny. It was hard, and by the time that I got out, you know, I, I was, you know, learning very, very quickly that I had been traumatized. Um, I wasn't the same person I was when I went in, and unfortunately, during the time that I was in the the prison, foster care dumped me back in my dad's custody, and so when I was released, I was sent right back to where everything had started, and nothing had changed. So I walked from school to the freeway and I hitchhiked. I took a very long route to get almost to Los Angeles and I've been here ever since. I got back here when I was 16 and I call it home. It's wild because when I was on the streets, I, I didn't think I would survive. And when I hit 18, I thought, you know, okay, fine, I'll get a job since I'm still alive. But when I got pregnant and when I had my kid, I knew that I needed to do something different. And I, I had this mindset that, you know, I needed to figure out how to find some kind of work that was stable, that would help support my kids so that they would have a better upbringing than me. When I had her, I remember I was sitting in the hospital and I was talking to my best friend, Michelle. I saw my kid and I saw the way the doctors were treating me, which wasn't good. They assumed because I had gone to the free clinic that you know I was less than and they treated me very poorly. And I kept telling her, you know, I feel like I want to be a doctor because nobody listens to me. Nobody cares. And that seed developed over years to where I knew I needed to go into medicine. I was able to use the federal financial aid that I suddenly qualified for because I had a kid. I remember, you know, going to all those welfare meetings and they kept telling me to go get a job. And I kept saying, you know, I'm going to go to school and I'll pay it all back. And I remember them laughing when I said it, but I knew I would get there. I guess they thought that I wouldn't be as successful as I planned to be. I knew that I needed to go to a university so I could apply to medical school. I had done so well at community college. I expected that I would continue the same thing and do what had worked for me and I would continue to succeed. I was wrong. I got into UCLA and so I accepted and then I found out I was pregnant with my son. So I was starting UCLA six months pregnant with a full-time job and a toddler and I was commuting. And so when you put all those things together, you know, it was already a recipe for a disaster. I hadn't really gotten the support I needed when I was in you know, high school or at the community college level, and so I hadn't been taught to go and see a counselor to help me figure out my classes. I had learned from a young age that adults didn't listen, and people in power especially didn't listen, and they didn't answer the questions that I asked. It's hard to trust someone is going to have your best interests at heart, especially when they've proven the opposite so many times. I enrolled in three science classes, and one of them, unfortunately, was a graduate level class and I didn't know it. I ended up failing my classes. In my first quarter at UCLA, I ended up on academic probation. I thought they were gonna kick me out, and that was terrifying for me because I could lose everything for a mistake. My biggest fear always was ending up back on the streets, but now I had kids and I was responsible for them and I didn't want to give up everything I had fought for. 
Even though I started doing better, it wasn't enough to correct the low grades in the beginning. When I graduated UCLA, I was kind of embarrassed that I had the GPA I had. I didn't walk. I didn't really feel like I had done what I had gone there to do. I didn't think that I deserved to be a doctor because I'd been in juvenile prison. I kept thinking, you know, because of all these things I did as a teenager, somewhere down the road there will be a block and someone will say, you can't do this. But I really believed I could. For many years, I felt like I couldn't have what I wanted. It was a dream I couldn't let go of. I ended up teaching for eight years before, you know, a couple of my colleagues finally pulled me aside and told me to go after my dream. That encouragement helped me to show up at the med school advisor's office so I could ask what the next steps were. When I applied to the U.S. medical schools, I didn't get any interviews. My advisor sent me back to apply to a Caribbean school, and I applied to one because they had a K-8 on campus. That meant that my kids could go to school with me, and it was the one place that said yes, and it was the one that gave me an opportunity to become a physician. And you know, looking back, it was the right place for me. Mind you, I've, I've never been in the hospital setting except as a patient. And I got into the hospital for my first night and I was volunteering and we had a patient that was, you know, in complete alcohol withdrawal and he smelled like urine and he was dirty and he was homeless and he was screaming. And, and I was like, oh my God, I love this. What do you want me to do? I'll do anything to have this job. You know, when I started residency, right after graduating medical school, we had all of our fresh white coats and all of us were so excited and smiling in our ID pictures. I felt like I'd finally made it. I was among a group of 11 other peers and we all had graduated from a very hard curriculum and we'd all passed our board exams and we ended up in the same space. And so it felt like a great equalizer. I had passed the same test, so that meant I was equally qualified. I want more doctors like me who have experienced homelessness, who have experienced poverty, the criminal justice system, foster care. I want people who have been through those experiences because that's what our patients need. When I walked into the hospital, it was like I was walking into home. I was supposed to be there.